Hello, this is Gary Fitzgerald, Senior Editor and Communication Strategist for Allergy and Asthma Network. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this month's webinar in our 2019 webinar series titled Advances in Allergy and Asthma, brought to you in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. This webinar series is an important part of an important collegial partnership and helps Allergy and Asthma Network live out our mission the same mission we've had since the network began almost 35 years ago. And that is to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Dr. J. Allen Meadows joins us today to speak about the history of inhalers, innovative, adv innovative advances in asthma medications, and what that can mean for you. Dr. Meadows is a clinical instructor of family practice and a clinical instructor of allergy at Alabama College of Osteopathic Medicine and a solo community-based practitioner at the Alabama Allergy and Asthma Clinic in Montgomery, Alabama. He is the current president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and past president of the JCAAI. He previously served as chairman of the Advocacy Council of the ACAAI on the Board of Regents of the college from 2003 to 2006, and as the college's speaker of the House of Delegates from 2009 to 2011. Dr. Meadows, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today, and we look forward to the information that you have to share with us. And I'll turn it over to Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much, and Sally for the kind introduction. Man, you you, you really you really made me sound good. I'm I'm reminded of, of of Brad Chips when he's done one of these before, and he just introduced himself as a country doctor from Sacramento. So that that that'll be my my tagline. I'm I'm I'm, I'm the country doctor from uh, Montgomery. Uh, before we get uh, started, I do want to mention a couple of disclosures uh, since we are talking about inhalers, and I. Uh, maybe a speaker for some com companies that make inhalers or have been on advisory boards. You'll see those listed here, Pfizer, Optinos, AstraZeneca, GSK, and Greer, uh, but really no direct impact on, on that. We're going to talk first a little bit about the, um, the history uh, of inhalers, and, and I'm actually, as it turns out, a, a collector of medical uh, asthma antiques, and most all the pictures that we see in today's talk, and I'll, I'll, I'll note the ones that are, but they're from my personal collection, so I didn't really need anyone's permission uh, to use the uh, images. Um, uh, I, I will be talking about one off-label use as, as we go through. That's something we're supposed to disclose, but I'll disclose that very specifically when we're talking about that. And, and because we are doing this for continuing education, we really can't talk about specific in, inhaler brands but, um, but we will be making reference to specific inhaler types because we want this to be something that's, that's beneficial uh, for everybody that's listening, whether you're a, uh, an asthma sufferer, whether you're a, a nurse who educates patients or, or a physician, uh, we wanna speak plainly so everybody knows what's going on. So we're gonna go back with our first slide from the beginning, and this, this slide actually is not from my collection. The Allergy and Asthma Network helped me with this, but the very first inhaler dates back to 1778. A fellow named uh, John Mudge, who was an English physician, and um, he kind of put a lid there. You see the picture of it on a pewter tanker, and they would uh, put opium vapor in there. Uh, and, and apparently the opium vapor was used to, to treat uh, a cough. And, and so this is our first uh, example of an, of an inhaler because even back in the, in the 1700s, people had the idea that if you got medicines into your lungs, it could help uh, the coughing and wheezing. Um, the next slides are, are gonna be ones from, from my personal uh, collection. This was a ceramic version of an inhaler. It's called Dr. Nelson's Improved Inhaler. And these are actually two examples uh, from my collection, but you'd put uh, herbs, uh, stramonium, uh, cubes, uh, opioids down in the bottom of these things and you'd, you'd heat it and it would, uh, would steam out. I'm, I'm not certain if either of these are original, just based on my exam of them. One looks like an original and one looks like a reproduction. And, one of them from taking a deep whiff uh, down in the bottom of it may have been used for something in modern times that, that may not have been uh, completely medicinal. 
Uh, but you know, they were kind of classified as an as an antique, and so we're able to to buy and sell and trade those on places like eBay. Whereas if it was you know a, a device to smoke marijuana, let's say, uh, th those are not legal to trade on those. But uh, I, I have suspicions that one of these two may have actually been used uh, for those purposes originally. But now it's just an antique uh, in my collection. Uh, another in in inhaler is one called Vapo Crystalline, and uh, there's a little uh, glass part uh, i'll point here right there that's where you place the kerosene that word says kerosene there and so you lit the kerosene and then it would ignite the fumes and they would would come up uh from from the from the top up here you would actually put the medicine in this area here and the fumes would, would launch one of the things i found about interesting about this one was the brand on this one uh allen and hanberries and that was uh actually a, a brand of, of or a company that made asthma medicines into the 1980s uh, was there were, were several things that were, were branded for that and was uh, acquired by one of the current pharmaceutical companies because so it's kind of kind of interesting that even back um, in, in the 1800s there were there were some brands that even survived uh, to modern times um, another thing that is very common and my patients find just absolutely amazing is that these they're, they're cigarettes that people use and and you wouldn't really need to um have any special device for these you just take one of the cigarettes out and you would light it and these cigarettes did not contain tobacco at all uh these examples contained uh, stramonium uh, one of them in this picture contained uh cubes and stramonium is a, is an anticholinergic and it's uh very similar to medicines that are on the market today in terms of uh, ipotropium is the, is the generic name and teotropium or anticholinergics that are available today. And so these were actually bronchodilators that were um, effective. And in my uh, personal collection of antiques, I, I particularly like to collect uh, things, not just because they were fascinating, but I like to you know, collect them because they worked. And so we've got uh, several examples, pages, inhalers, asthma door, blousers, uh, there was one called uh, 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 hemorrhoids. I mean, there were just, just many of the different types of, uh, of in, inhalers. And then concomitant with the, with the inhalers were stramonium powders. And, and these powders could be put in the top of a vapocrystalline and lit and ignited. Many of them had caps that you could, could put the inhaler in there and, and, and light it. But again, here's a couple of examples, hemorrhoids, the box and the uh, and, and the jar that's that's there, uh, braiders, nut nows. I've got I've got many of these uh, in, in my collection. So these were just powders that people would ignite, and apparently some of these you could put in the cap. And I, I've seen pictures of people with a, a like a, a hood over their head, like a towel or something, and, and you drop the match into the cap, and it kind of flash and and, and ignite, and would give people relief of a uh, bronchoconstriction. Uh, one of my favorite ones, this is a, a Canadian uh, one, uh, Kellogg's Asthma Relief. And you actually see the fellow here that's inhaling the stuff from, 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 from a device that was lit. So the, the label actually um, gave an example, but this is another one of the, of the Stramonium products. And right there it says on the cover, Asthma Relief. And, you know, these were along before the, uh, the FDA was uh, available and the Drug Act of uh, 1901, which made a lot of these things go away. But in fact, um, I, I've got uh, one example of one of the stramonium powders, the asthma door, door powder, that was in a plastic container. And, and doing research on, on those, it, it, it really, those types of containers weren't used very broadly before the 1960s. And so it's, it's amazing that some of these uh, in, inhalers and, and things that give people, people relief were from the 60s. Now, the next slide I'm going to give you, this is actually the, something that's uh, a commercial that I have uh, in my office, in one of my exam rooms, it's it's framed, um, and and this is Marshall's prepared uh, cubes, and it's for hay fever, throat disease, asthma, catarrh. Catarrh was just just something that ran. You could have catarrh of the nose or the of the bowels, and I, I love this one. It's for foul breath uh, too. But you see the you know the the pretty Victorian lady there uh, smoking it, and so it, it's a conversation piece that's. Um, that I have uh, in, in my office uh, today, and I just, just took a picture of it 
um, off the wall. And just so that we'll specifically know what Marshalls were, that I, I've got several different uh, brands of Marshalls, but I mean, these are cigarettes. So I, this was one that kind of was easy to open. I don't want to damage the containers. I don't open them very often, but I opened this one because actually the top's missing so that you could see uh, what the what the cigarette looked like. And it, it looks similar to a tobacco cigarette, only considerably shorter and, and did have a little bit of a filter on the end uh, as well. But these, this one was not stramonium. This was the, the cube. And I think that those were somewhat effective because they had some anticholinergic uh, properties to them, but probably possibly not as effective as, um, as the stramonium. Now, nebulizers. Um, electric nebulizers first became available uh, in the late 1920s and the 1930s, but they were very expensive and, and most people couldn't afford them. And, and so into the 1900s, we had some many devices like this. This is just one example, the asthma nephrine device, but I've uh, got one that was made by Abbott. I have several different ones, but these are just pictures how that you'd have a squeeze bulb, you put the medicine in a little plastic container like that, and then you, you then you'd puff on it. And, um, and you're able to uh, uh, atomize some epinephrine into your lung. And in fact, asmonephrine was a brand uh, of ep epinephrine. And, and typically what they were nebulizing and even an electric uh, nebulizer in those days was epinephrine, which came under many different brands. I guess the most common one we're familiar with is adrenaline. That was ejected one, but asmonephrine is one of, of many uh, brands that I have um, in my personal collection. Now, there's some other examples uh, of inhalers here. I, I took a picture of these. These are more like the, 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 the Vicks type nasal inhalers that a lot of us have seen growing up with. The, the Indian Chief is one here. It, it mostly had herbs. I think you can see pine oil and mustard listed on that one. But focus in on, on this, this benzodrine inhaler right here. If, if you can see that word right there. Friends, this is actually from, I think from the 40s and the 50s. That's an amphetamine uh, an, an inhaler. And I'm, you know, I guess I'm pretty sure that, you know, amphetamine will just, uh, I guess what they said, it would cure whatever ailed you. So, um, but these are a couple of examples of, of other types of inhalers that were, were available. So um, pretty much uh, we'll move on a little bit from the history likes. And the, the, the next thing I want to talk about is the first, uh, the first modern inhaler. And the first modern inhaler came on the market in uh, 1956. It was a pressurized meter dose inhaler, very similar to what many of us know and recognize today. It was developed by George Mason. He was president of Riker Labs and his daughter had severe asthma. And they actually kind of made a working prototype. I think it was in a basement where they had an old ice cream freezer and empty soda bottles and, and, a, and a bottle capper and were able to, to bring this to the market to, as the first modern inhaler. And several years ago, I had an opportunity to visit with some of the people who worked with Riker in the early days that they were uh, inventing. And it was just fascinating to, to hear them talk about it. So it, it came in two brands. It came as the over-the-counter over metahaler, which was epinephrine. And um, epinephrine inhalers for the rapid relief of asthma are, have been available to modern times. They were off the market for a little bit for CFC. And I know we work with the Allergy and Asthma Network to try to keep epinephrine inhalers <laughs> off the market as over-the-counter inhalers, but they're uh, unfortunately back. We, I, I agree with the Allergy and Asthma Network. Asthma is not a do-it-yourself illness. We think that you need the supervisor vision of healthcare providers to help you with that. But they also had um, isoproteranol. So they had both an over-the-counter version and a, a, a prescription. Uh, version. And so that was a first there. The, the other first that I, I, I want to look at um, is the first inhaled steroid. Interestingly, it was approved in 1972. And the rumors are that Senator Edward Kennedy from Massachusetts uh, put pressure on the FDA to approve this because one of the Kennedy nephews had been prescribed Vansoril in, in Great Britain. Um, and, and, and truthfully, back in the early 1970s, we really in the United States, if you look at the medical literature, didn't have a, a great idea about how to use an inhaled steroid. Today, we all take it for granted that an inhaled steroid is a cornerstone of, of, of asthma therapy. But even looking at the first NIH guidelines that came out in 1987, uh, they kind of listed you know, theophylline and um, uh, inhaled steroids and, and chromalin all on the same level as options that we could use. And, and really, we didn't, at least in my opinion, the United States have a, have, have a real understanding about how to use an, inhaled steroids until the, 
till the late 1980s. So we'll move off the history level lesson and um, into today's inhaler type so we can talk about something practical for people uh, choosing inhalers today. There, there are essentially three types of inhalers that, that are available. We have the classic uh, HFA meter dose inhaler, which is the traditional press and breathe uh, inhaler. We have dry powder inhalers, and there are a broad variety of those. And then there's one, because we don't want to use brand names, that I'm referring to a, as a softness device, uh, which is patented by a, a specific pharmaceutical company and is, is pictured there uh, on the left of your, your screen where it delivers a, a, a soft mist. Almost a, to me, I think of it as a, as a hybrid between what you get from a nebulizer and what you get from a, from a, from a press and breathe. And so those are the ones that we're, we're, we're dealing with today. So when you think about inhalers, always think about spacers. And most people agree that, that, that patients, not just children, need to use uh, a meter dose inhaler medicine with a spacer. And every few years, you'll hear about a pharmaceutical company that launches a campaign that their uh, MDI doesn't need a spacer because they were, were researched that way. And really, except for a few exceptions of auto inhaler devices, uh, none of those claims have proven to be effective in real world settings. But you hear drug reps, pharmacists at the drug counter proudly proclaim that these were approved and researched without a spacer. And they get told that a spacer is a waste of, of, of money. And so when, when, you, when your doctor or your, your nurse practitioner shows you how to use the, the medicine, they're designing a treatment plan that is designed to be used the way they show you to use it. And it's kind of concerning to me and really alarming that other people in our, our healthcare will, 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 will undermine that. So why is it that pharmaceutical companies and drug reps and uh, pharmacists, you know, think about this? Well, looking at the next slide, the patients in research studies are different from those in your typical outpatient clinic. Uh, the people in your, in your research studies are paid to take the drugs. They're kicked out if they're non-compliant. Many of them already have a modest amount of remodeling so that they can easily enter into qualify in, in a study. And remodeling, you know, we, we use that term, it's a medical scientific term, you know, when you re remodel the here in Alabama, when you remodel the single wide into a double wide, that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, but remodeling of the lungs, the term I like to use uh, down here that my patients understand is scarring. Uh, and, and everybody knows that, that scarred lungs uh, aren't good. And so a lot of these patients, so that they already have low lung function and they can readily uh, qualify to enter these studies, already have a degree of lung scarring so that lung function is already a little bit low on a good day. But here's the big one, the last bullet point here, is that the FDA requires that people entering an asthma study be screened at entrance to know how to use a press and breathe inhaler without a spacer, and it's called a reversibility test. And so the FDA is not being sinister and the pharmaceutical companies aren't trying to pull one over on anybody. The FDA just wants to know that everybody who enters an asthma trial has asthma. And the best way that they prove that is that they bring them in, they give them an inhaler and they can only give them the a rescue inhaler. Uh, uh, they can only give them a, a rescue inhaler under an FDA approved the device. And so that's a press and breathe straight into the mouth. And they have to uh, demonstrate that their spirometry improves by 12% to enter the study. So interestingly, the people that are in these research studies were screened at entrance to be able to use a press and breathe inhaler without a spacer. And in the and the next slide is a, is a research study that my, my friend Kate and Seth uh, up in Indy, Indiana uh, uh, did. This is looking at studies in his office with um, that were the typical research study paper patient, and and this looks at a dry powder inhaler and an MDI. And amazingly, it was it was a shock to me, but among patients who were screened at entrance of a study to be able to use a press and breathe without a spacer, amazingly, on the first attempt, 98% of them actually could do that. And in this study, we, we also saw that they could use um, a, a dry powder uh, in, in, inhaler. Now, on the next slide, we're going to change gears a little bit. This is the percentages of patients who are accurate. The next slides are going to show the percentage of patients who couldn't do it. And, and this one is 300 patients in the lobby of an adult pulmonary clinic. And the DPI disc was correct, handled correctly more often than the NPI, but 75% of the 
of patients in the lobby of a pulmonary practice. All right, so these are just people not in a family practice office. These are people in a respiratory office. 75% of them couldn't use a press and breathe without a spacer. And 67% of those errors were due to failure to coordinate the actuation and the inspiration. Interestingly, in, in the dry powder inhaler that was used in this uh, study, uh, only 7% of them uh, couldn't do that. And, uh, and certainly we don't want to leave kids out because we've, we've thought of kids. This is looking, the next slide I think is looking at um, children in a, uh, in a pediatric uh, a practice, and it was a little bit worse uh, for, the, for, the, for the kids. 78% of the children uh, weren't able to use a press and breathe without a spacer, and 5% and weren't able to use uh, or weren't able to use a dry powder inhaler. So the disparity in a real life study in, in children was even uh, greater. And again, about half the kids weren't able to do it because of, of a failure to coordinate. And that's why some of these automatic inhalers that are, that are the old um, uh, uh, you know, MDI technology work because it eliminates uh, that area uh, or error for sure. So moving on uh, to our next slide. Um, dry powder controller inhalers, when you look at research studies, show a numeric trend of a higher refill persistence. And what that means is if we look at, at, at research studies about how people will fill their prescriptions at a drugstore, whether they're in an HMO or a, a non-HMO, they tend to show that dry powder inhalers are filled more often than the press and breathe. But the reasons to me are not entirely clear. I mean, obviously you'd want to assume that because they're easier to use. The dry powder inhalers are easier to use because they, they'll fill them more often. But there may be other factors that are contributing to that. The dry powder inhalers have historically been marketed more aggressively by the pharmaceutical companies than the traditional press and breathe. Uh, another thing is, is combination inhalers where they have an inhaled steroid and a long acting bronchodilator in them. Those tend to give patients some sense of, a, of, a, of immediate relief and uh, combination controller inhalers are typically uh, filled more often than single ingredient steroids and they're more commonly in a dry powder inhaler. And in preparing for this talk, I, I did some research and looking at it and there weren't many studies that were comparing brands of different pharmaceutical companies. Most of them were farm comparing brands of the same pharmaceutical company who says that our new brand Y is so much better than our old brand X because patients fill it more often and uh, must be because it's easier to use. Uh, but in general, I think we'll, we'll, we'll go with the conclusion that, that, that there's at least a new merit trend that dry powder inhalers um, are filled more commonly than the old style press and breathe. So when you're choosing an inhaler for your patient, when you're choosing an inhaler for yourself, what are the factors that we wanna, wanna look into? Well, there are some contributing factors with that. Age, insurance coverage, whether you don't have insurance, and a subgroup that may be prone to one of the common side effects from inhaled steroids, uh, thrush and dysphonia. And dysphonia just means you get a hoarse, you have a, have a hard time speaking. So we'll, we'll cover these uh, one, one at a time. The first is, is age consideration. And MDI medications and spacers, you know, you can pretty much find a research study that proves whatever point uh, that you want to make. Um, and so I kind of divided them up into less than four, four to six, and greater than six, but all the studies weren't divided, divided this way. In the children that are less than four years old, many of us would use a press and breathe with a chamber, a mask, or a nebulizer. But you can get research studies that show one better than the other, and the opposite is true. And, and here's why. Many of the medicine cups in a nebulizer uh, don't deliver any medicine that can enter the lower airway. I remember Rand Malone at uh, National Jewish did research when I was, was there, and we found that the most common uh, nebulizer that was on the market at that time delivered almost no medicine to the lower airway 75% of the time, depending on how, how it was, was, was set up. And so the, the cheap light plastic nebulizers typically don't deliver particles that can get down into a child's lung. And so if you're comparing a press and breathe uh, with a chamber with a mask to um, a, a nebulizer that's inefficient, then the chamber with the mask is going to win. But if you have a high efficiency jet nebulizer that delivers a high percentage of the medicine in the lung and compare that to a chamber with a mask, it might be more effective. So we want to use a technique that works for each patient. Uh, the age four to six years, uh, looking at the data on this, uh, you're looking at a, a press and breathe with a chamber with or without a mask. 
And again, there's as many studies that, that are supporting your point of view as you would want to find that show that four to six year olds can use a, a chamber with a mouthpiece, a four to six year old it does better with a chamber with, with, with a mask. I, I truthfully, my preference in this age group, and it's individualized for each child, but is to use the, the chamber with the mask uh, in, in this age group. There was formerly a collapsible spacer that I uh, liked a, a, a lot. And I think it was called Inspiris. It's no longer uh, available anymore. And I, I, miss, I miss that one. But you individualize it to, to each child. And then when you start looking at the children over six, uh, typically you would be looking at a dry powder inhaler. Uh, many of the dry powder inhalers are approved down to age four, but some of the kids in my practice have a hard time coordinating that. Or a chamber with a mouthpiece. I think clearly by the time you get to a, a six-year-old, you're delivering more medicine floor airway using chamber with a mouthpiece as opposed to a chamber with, with a mask. So shifting gears from age coverage, let's move on to uh, insurance coverage. A lot of our patients have insurance and that's a good thing, but the co-pays on drugs now are commonly as high as $50 and, and, and I've seen them $100. And we know that the, the, the insurance companies, uh, the drug preferred dress is often uh, too narrow. And for many drugs, purchasing them outside of the insurance is less expensive, but it's, it's rare for inhalers. There are some instances where it is, and I'll actually point one of those out as we, we move along. And part of the problem for this is a, is a, is a middleman called the pharmacy benefit manager who uh, kind of comes between the insurance company and the and the drugstore. And I, I kind of think of the pharmacy benefit manager as that creepy third person that's in the room with you in the exam room. You know, I'm in the exam room, I've got my patient there, and the creepy third dark person that's in the room is the pharmacy benefit manager that tells us what we can and can't do, even though we want to have a, a nice conversation and have shared decision making. We've, we've got to watch out for the pharmacy benefit manager in there. Now, the pharmacy benefit manager companies used to have gag clauses with the drugstore that they could not tell you that if it was cheaper for the patient or the consumer to buy their medicine outside of the insurance than inside of the insurance. I remember a, a time I, I take thyroid medicine and uh, my wife had gotten a job and we got insurance covered that covered our medicines. And I went to the drugstore to get my thyroid medicine and I found that it was more expensive with my insurance. And so I looked at the guys and I said, how about we run that outside of my insurance so I could pay the cheaper price that I was paying, paying before? Well, uh, Representative Buddy Carter from Savannah, Georgia, uh, proposed a law that was passed, I think, with 96 positive votes in, in, the, in the Senate that now makes those gag clause illegal. But there's no requirement that the drugstore tells you if something is cheaper. So now, so with my patients with insurance, I'm looking at whether or not that they can use a coupon or not. And coupons are frustrating for many of us as physicians because sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And so just to kind of look at the reason why sometimes they don't, the Affordable Care Act, um, and um, that's commonly referred to as Obamacare. I don't think that's a, ref a respectful term and so I don't usually use it, but I want everybody on the, uh, the call to understand what we're talking about. But the Affordable Care Act made it illegal to use coupons for many groups, anybody with federal insurance. And so that's Medicaid, Medicare, TRICARE, uh, the CHIP program, and even at first, even federal employees. Now, the ACA was amended in December 2017, which allowed federal employees to use the coupons, but still many of the pharmaceutical companies, even though that's two years ago now, many of the pharmaceutical companies, many of the, the drug stores think that that's still in place. And so you've got a coupon that's absolutely valid, but the, the drug store won't let them use it or the insurance company won't let them use it because of the, the law that was appealed in 2017. The other thing that the Affordable Care Act did was that they, they made it illegal to use a coupon for non-FDA approved use. And, Unfortunately, most of the medicines that have coupons uh, are, are only approved initially for children down to age 12. And so most, most asthma drugs with coupons aren't approved for under 12, and that makes it very, very difficult. And some insurance companies have done some clever things to kind of cleverly block uh, from being able to use coupons. So one of the things that I, I do is I use an, an app on my iPhone, and I think it's available on uh, an Android as well, called um, the coverage search app. Now this one used to be called formulary. It's come under, under several, several different names now, but right now I have searched um, a, a specific generic drug that I want to prescribe for a patient. It's coded into Alabama and it's for commercial insurance. And I can click on the commercial insurance there, not on the slide, but on my, uh, on my phone. And I can change that over to uh, 
Medicare or Medicaid if I want to. And then these are the most common uh, insurance companies, uh, pharmacy benefit providers in Alabama. And it, it tabs on down. And so interestingly, this generic inhaler is not covered by my most common carrier in Alabama, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama. And so I clicked here and this is what it showed over here. And so here is a list of generic drugs that are covered. And if I wanted to click, I could click right here and look at the brand drugs that were covered. This this program is exhaustive. It, it has insurance coverage of almost everybody that walks in your door, but because there's so many hundreds, if not thousands of these, it really takes some learning to be able to use the, the, the coverage app. My nurse practitioner is still not very comfortable with it, and she's been with me uh, for, for, for several months, but that's uh, one of the ways that does that. Now, I wanna shift gears from your patient with insurance coverage to the uninsured patient. Uh, I know we all have a lot of uninsured uh, patients, patients, and even though the Affordable Care Act was trying to provide that they wouldn't, there's still too many of them. Um, most coupons exclude the uninsured, and I found the GoodRx app is particularly helpful to me, and this is actually a picture of a screenshot of the, of the GoodRx app where I requested a specific uh, generic in there, and see, without insurance, just, just having the GoodRx card, you get this combination therapy, very good medicine for $51. But look how the price goes up. These are listed numerically when they come in here, but from very low to, to, to very high. And so I find this incredibly helpful when I'm working with patients and it's not always empiric. I'm not trying to promote one of these pharmacies over the other, quite honestly. Uh, it's, it's like throwing dice about which one is gonna be uh, acceptable. I know a lot of times for the uninsured, we'd always given our patients samples but at least in my practice, we're getting fewer and fewer samples. Now, I did say in the introduction, I was gonna mention one off-label use, and I am gonna talk about an off-label use right now, not for a specific product, but a lot of times I will take a controller inhaler that is a high-dose inhaler that's approved for a twice-a-day use, and I'll use that off-label once a day so that my patient would only have to fill it. So for instance, if I was choosing to use this combination of fluticasone and salmeterol off-label, say I was using the highest dose that the 232 microgram dose, and they went to Walmart or Walgreens and got it for 5114, but I only told them to take it once a day, then that inhaler would last them for two months and it would cut the price of their, their drug in half. And of course, we would always prefer to use on-label preferred uh, drugs, but <clears throat> sometimes you have to work with people. And when I'm doing shared decision-making with them, particularly with the uninsured, I ask them point blank, how much money uh, can you spend on this? I remember a patient I saw just a, a, a few days ago uh, that um, actually I conducted the interview in Spanish because they uh, didn't speak much English and I asked them how much dinero that they could spend on a monthly basis and they, they came out with $300, which I said, oh, we can do much better than that. Um, so um, I was quite pleased to do that. Another subgroup that we look at is those that are prone to thrush or dysphonia. And the drop powder inhalers tend to have a higher incidence of these side effects. Uh, the small particle inhalers, at least in the pivotal trials, tended to have an incidence of thrush that was equal to placebo. Um, the small particle inhalers are classified by the National Institute of Health, typically as lower potency. And so these may not be a great option for patients with severe asthma requiring frequent courses of systemic steroids, but I've actually tried those uh, in, in combination with a, an individual uh, long-acting bronchodilator or a long-acting um, anticholinergic. So, and this is just looking at the, uh, an example of the small particle inhalers, uh, beclomethazone, uh, seclesonide, those are both on the market, flunicilide is not on the market, and then comparing that to uh, an HFA inhaler, fluticasone, which has bigger particles, and then the dry powder inhalers. And the incidence of thrush and dysphonia was equivalent to placebo for the three smaller particle uh, and, and inhalers that were there. So I just wanna compare now, as we get close to the end here, the different types of inhalers and see what might be best for you. So the meter dose inhaler, the pros, they're generally less expensive. They are widely available, both as prevention medicines and rescue inhalers. And they're often more commonly preferred on insurance. They have a familiar design. Everybody knows what an inhaler is. And the small particle steroid decreases the risk of dysphonia. The risk of the press and breathe MDI inhalers, hard for a lot of people to use without a spacer, and spacers are expensive and not covered by your insurance in most cases. Uh, dry powder inhalers, I think we've seen evidence to show that they're probably the easiest to use, and they may have higher refill rates, uh, but because of the bigger particle size, they have a higher incidence of thrush. 
Some of the older dry powder inhalers require extraordinarily high inspiratory rates. Uh, so our patients with, with, with severe asthma may not be able to, to suck that hard. There's only one brand of rescue inhaler in a dry powder inhaler. And, and unfortunately, in some parts of the country, the dry powder inhalers aren't as, as preferred. And then looking at the, the soft mist inhalers, that's the one that I showed the, the, the picture of earlier. The pro on that one is, is that even people with very low inspiratory force can use them, but they're limited for use in, in asthma because there's no inhaled steroid in them and they're, um, and they're kind of expensive. So which inhaler is the best choice for you? Well, there are many factors to consider. In general, in my practice, I believe that dry powder inhalers are better for many, but not for all. And I believe that's one of the advantages of, of seeing an, an allergist. Uh, because the allergist and a respiratory specialist is not going to prescribe you what is the best inhaler for the average patient. They're going to prescribe you what's the best inhaler for you. And, and God bless our primary doctors. They have to do a lot. I'm not, not dissing them at all. How could I possibly remember to treat all the things that they know to treat? But, you know, they remember the, the best treatment for the average patient or the best too. But which inhaler is the best for you? Well, I think that is a choice that is best sh a shared decision between the healthcare provider and the asthma patient. So what is shared decision-making? Well, shared decision-making is a collaborative process that allows patients and their providers to make healthcare decisions together, taking into account the best scientific evidence available as well as the patient's uh, uh, values in that. And so SHARE, and a little acronym here, you sync the patient participation and communicate the options. You help the patient explore and compare options. You assess the patient's values and, <clears throat> and preferences. What matters the most? You know, how much does it cost? Then you reach the decision and you um, uh, evaluate the decision. And really, you know, the old days of the, the Marcus Welby MD and, and, and the father knows best where the doctor comes in and, and tells you what it is, that, that just doesn't make it uh, in, in today's world. And so it needs to be a shared decision between uh, the, the doctor and between uh, the patient about what is, is best for them. I remember being at, a, at a, an advisory board for one of the pharmaceutical companies and the doctor was describing his shared decision-making process and the, another physician who was sitting a, a, immediately to my left looked up and says, well, see, that, that's not shared decision-making, that's you sharing your decision with the patient. And, and so if there's not a collaboration here, it's really not true uh, shared decision-making. So when, when, we, when we use shared decision-making, the providers discuss with the patient the condition their medicines and uh, to determine their needs. Consider access to care and finances when, when prescribing. You know, even if it's not a self-pay patient, you know, how much is your copay on this medicine? I kind of like to look at the list of drugs myself and say, all right, uh, drug XYZ here, how much are you paying for that? Or if they're, they're not on any medicines, is anybody in the family taking medicines? Oh, good, you're taking this medicine for this branded medicine for gout. How much does that one cost? Because you know that that's probably gonna be their preferred tier copay. And you need to make sure the patient understands how to use the medicine. In my office, we, we do two tiers of teaching. I have my staff teach people the technical ways about to use the medicine. And then I do teaching some of the technical ways, but more about the why to use the medicines. Now, the patient's responsibility in shared decision-making, ask about how uh, a prescribed medicine works, um, be prepared to take the medicine the way they tell you to do. I tell you, that's one thing that doctors are gonna be pretty disappointed about. If you come back and you haven't filled the medicine or, or you decided you know, before you left that you really didn't want to do that, that's something that you need to, to talk to them about and be honest with your doctor about. You know, I'm never upset with a patient that's not taking their medicines. The ones that's hard for me to work with are the ones that don't tell me the truth about that. And then share any side effects with your provider. But um, there are a number of shared decision-making tools that are uh, available. Uh, through the Allergy and Asthma Network and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. We have worked together on several of these shared decision-making tools. You can go either to the college's website or the website of the Allergy and, and Asthma Network and, um, and, and look those up and, and, and use those either on your own as a patient or as a doctor to sh share them with the patient so that when, they come to, when your patient comes back, you're prepared to have um, a, a helpful and fruitful discussion so that um, everybody will, will get their medicines and fill their medicines. So in the next slide, we're going to show you, this is just a small part of my antique collection. I pretty much quit collecting many new medicines. It has to be something that I really want badly because I've run out of places to put them and my wife won't let me carry them home. Uh, this probably represents about a third uh, of, of my collection, but um, 
you know, maybe if, if, if I get another opportunity to give a talk, we can, uh, we can talk about some more um, antique medicines uh, as we go along. But Gary, I'm going to ask you to come back on. We're going to uh, put it up for questions now. I don't know. I kind of like leaving my, my, my antiques there because I like looking at them. I enjoy them. But, but Gary, if we have any questions right now, I believe we have 10 or 15 minutes that we can answer some of those. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Meadows. And uh, as as you said, we'll now start taking questions. Um, uh, the first question we have coming in is, uh, do the DPIs, the tri-powder inhalers, uh, do they have a great deal of nasopharyngeal deposition still? Well, the dry powder inhalers don't have any nasal deposition because you can't use them with a chamber with a, a mask. The dry powder inhalers, though, do have a great deal more of oral and pharyngeal deposition. And so that's when we have the side effects like the trouble talking and uh, the, the, the higher instance of thrush with those. So that's certainly a, a downside of a dry powder inhaler. There is a whole lot more oral pharyngeal deposition. I don't think there's any nasal deposition. The nasal deposition would be just with the chamber with the mask with the press and breathe. And I'm not aware of being able to use a DPI that way. Although I have, when asking patients to demonstrate how they use medicines, I have seen them attempt to use a dry powder inhaler with the spacer. It's generally not very successful. Uh, next question. Sure. Uh, so we have uh, another question. Uh, it, it touches on insurance. Uh, do you get pushback from insurers when uh, RXing high dose uh, ICS for daily use, and as claims may show, patient non-compliant if only filling every other day. So, do you get pushback from insurers? Absolutely, I get um, I get a stack um, of, and I use um, I still use paper charts, but I get a stack without the charts, um, almost a foot deep every month. Uh, from insurance companies and pharmacy benefit managers telling me my patients are being non-compliant. Uh, I would say that uh, a certain percentage of those are people that I've directed to use the medicine once a day that's approved for twice a day use. I want to be very clear that this is an off-label use uh, that, that, uh, that, that we're pro providing here because it's CME. I got to, you know, like say if it's off-label. So those are, if it was you know, designed to be used twice a day and you tell them to use it once a day, I, I get that. But I would say, um, in the neighborhood of, of, of a half to a third of the ones I get are people that are actually not adherent. I don't know what other, other physicians uh, do with that, but I, um, I uh, contact those uh, patients and, and encourage them to use their medicines, encourage them to use a follow-up visit. In terms of the, the high-dose medicine, um, occasionally pharmacy benefit managers will say, hey, you're a bad doctor. You're using a high-dose combination in therapy. Don't do that. But Gary, remember the most of the people that I'm doing this with are either my underinsured or particularly the ones that I'm doing that with are the uninsured. And uh, th those people have very limited financial resources. And so if they're uninsured, I don't hear back from a pharmacy benefit manager uh, on that. But yes, sir, those are the two things we, we deal with. I make notations in the chart. If the pharmacy benefit manager wants it faxed back, I'll just fax it back to them, instruct the patient to use once a day. It goes back and it's documented. But uh, it, it's, it's a big it's a big time use, but you know, you know, for that third of the half, the patients really are not in here. Maybe saving a life there. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, you know, prioritizations what insurance companies do to us on that. But that one actually may be helpful a lot of the time. Great. Uh, our next question: uh, Are allergy specialists trained to educate their patients to use an inhaler, and is this sort of built into their education? All right, uh, you, you broke up just a little bit in the beginning, so could you repeat the question? Sure. Are allergy specialists trained to educate their patients to use an inhaler? Is this built into their education? Well, you know, allergy specialty training is, is done after you've had uh, three years of pediatrics or three years of internal medicine. And most of the allergy fellowship training programs particularly ones that are geared toward turning people in, into, into clinical practice, do have an emphasis on ed, ed, education. And it, in fact, is part of our, um, our, our board examination in terms of, of inhaler, inhaler technique. I think uh, that there is some degree of standardization, but there could be some variability. But I, I can speak for myself and where, where I trained, it was a huge part of what, what we learned to do. And uh, a lot of times when you discovered a patient wasn't doing well or feeling well, it's because they weren't using their inhaler right. And um, <laughs> because they weren't taught to use their inhaler, inhaler right. So I, I wouldn't assume just because you saw a specialist that the patient was 
shown how to use an inhaler properly, but I think that is the part of, of the training for the vast majority of us. And our next question uh, comes in, what type of inhaler should schools stock? I think this, uh, not necessarily from a brand perspective, but from a dry powder versus uh, uh, MDI. Well, um, and certainly that's one of the big uh, issues that, uh, that the college and the allergen asthma network share in terms of advocacy. I came up on the advocacy side of our organization in terms of having uh, stock inhalers in there. Um, Wow, uh, that's kind of a, a, a tough question I haven't thought about before. Um, you know, you would think about the dry powder inhaler because it's it's easier to use and most people could uh, can, can use it and, and suck hard. But then you also think about the press and breathe uh, with 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 the spacer because more people are more familiar uh, with with the press and breathe. You know, I think that would be a discussion I would share with the individual school nurse and what that person was more comfortable with in their school and what the the kids in the school generally. Uh, we're, we're, we're using and if she was more comfortable or he were more comfortable using a press and breathe with a spacer then I think that that, that might be the choice there. Um, for completely um, inhaler naive patients uh, I'd choose the dry powder inhaler. So um, Gary I'm sorry that was a definite maybe to answer <laughs> that question. Uh, okay that's fine. Uh, our next question is something that has been uh, is sort of in the news lately. Um, uh, I, it's the question, I've been reading a lot about how dry powder inhalers are better for the environment. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, it depends on how you define better for the in environment. The old CFC inhalers um, really release fluorocarbons, which there was some concern that they may cause a, a problem with, with ozone. Um, quite honestly, Actually, the total amount that was in an inhaler worldwide in, in, in a year was probably insignificant. The big issue on that was just because we, we moved away as, as, as a global society from making those, it just became un, un, unavailable. And so the, 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 the CFC is generally thought to be more environmentally friendly. You know, you know my concern is, is that plastic that we're throwing in the landfill. And, and unfortunately, that, that neither the dry powder inhalers nor the press and breathe are, are kind of refillable. They, they were not, not designed that way. So that you get a dry powder inhaler, which is, is which is a big technology, and you throw it away. There's some new technologies that are coming in inhalers that I'm really excited about, where they'll integrate with your smartphone and will you know monitor your lung function when you inhale them. I've seen some prototypes on these, and they've got you know, big computer chips in them. And I talked to the manufacturer about them, and there's more than one of them, but but just as recently as two weekends ago, talked to him about it. The plan is just to throw them away. So um, the, the dry powder inhalers tend to be a little bit bigger in terms of space they take up in, 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 a, in a landfill, but I think there are environmental concerns uh, about both. And so in my mind, even if you were a, a very environmentally conscious patient, um, I don't think that that's a deciding factor for you. I think uh, that, that I would use other factors to decide which type of inhaler I wanted. Okay, a, a few more questions. Uh, do you ever combine big particle, big particle steroid inhalers with smaller particle inhalers to get larger bronchial lung coverage? Um, that is uh, the, the, the big particle and the small particle to get them spread further apart. That's something that a lot of us thought about and did. Um, I did more commonly in, in the past. Uh, quite honestly, now if I've got somebody that's on a high dose uh, inhaled steroid and they're and they're failing that and they're on frequent courses of oral steroids, I'm very likely with those patients to move on to a biologic. Uh, in an era where we only had one biologic and it was very hard to get approved, uh, I would I would commonly try um, what I would call tricks like that. Um, uh, I still have a few patients, probably less than half a dozen in the practice, that take uh, a medium dose. A dry powder inhaler and one of the small particle inhalers together that seem to get relief of that. I think it's a a, a, a valid theory, but it's an awful lot of work it, on the patient. It, the more medicines we pile on them, the, the less adherent our, our patients are. So now, you know, you've got a rescue inhaler, two prevention inhalers, a nose spray. Many of those severe patients have got reflux too. You know, they've got a pharmacy in the house. I'm I'm more likely on those patients uh, over the last two or three years to move on to a biologic. 
And we have a, another question coming in from, uh, it sounds like a healthcare professional. What's more effective in children, nebulizer or inhalers? Uh, she says, a lot of parents I work with complain that inhalers don't work. Well, I touched on that in the talk, and it's it's an area I had previously done research in before preparing for this talk, and, and while I was doing that, you can find a research study that will prove just about any point you want you want to make, and that's because of the, of the variance in the nebulizers. The vast majority of the medicine cups and nebulizers on the market today deliver no medicine that will enter a child's lung, and so the press and breathe with the mask is going to beat the heck out of that inhaler every time. But there are, are, are several more expensive uh, medicine cups that go with the, the nebulizer setup that deliver high efficiency amounts of medicine in, into the lungs. And quite honestly, those are hard to beat. They deliver a lot of medicines to the lung. So that gives you a lot of good effects, also gives you the risk of, 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 of more side effects. But again, this is another one, Gary, where the answer is going to have to be a definite uh, maybe. And that's an area where we get into shared decision making. And so if you've got a got a patient that they have a personal preference to use a nebulizer and they believe it works better for them, then you design a treatment plan to, to work that way. Uh, the vast majority of my patients don't want to be tied down to the nebulizer. It takes too long. Even the high efficiency nebulizers take several minutes to run. They want to want to do something so that they can get on with their life and use uh, the press and breathe. I, I, I commonly, with the press and breathe with the pediatric patients, would prescribe doses of inhaled steroids which were outside of what the FDA approved because I know that they're getting very little medicine of that. But again, that's a decision I share with the patient. We make that together if we're, we're going to do that, if we're doing that for convenience. And then, I'm, then I pretty much insist that they come in for follow-up visits pretty regularly so, so I can monitor uh, for, for, for those side effects. But, but, but Gary, I mean, the, the big thing on this is, is, you know, what can your patient do? All right. Um, you, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a negotiation uh, that I have. I'm kind of reminded of my children when they were adolescents and, you know, I don't want to do this, dad. And, you know, well, well, what, what can we do? All right. You know, what, what compromise can, you know, can we, can we reach here? And so that's, that's the attitude I take on that. There's not one right answer on that. And uh, to, to wrap up, we have one last question uh, that I think you're going to love. Where have you found your collection? It's amazing. <laughs> oh, um, my collection began before there was the internet. Um, uh, my mother actually purchased several of these. I've got an old uh, Chinese medicine bottle that's, um, that's hundreds of years old. But uh, when uh, e eBay started in the, in the early days, um, there were a lot of things out there, and it amazed me that, that I didn't have to just collect old medicine bottles. I could collect old uh, asthma bottles. I have, have found over the last five years that, that eBay tends to be, at least for medicine inhalers, less mom, moms and pops selling things and more corporate people. I, I also collect old books, and I've got uh, some original pivotal books on asthma. I've got several copies of Henry Hyde's Salter's uh, first um, uh uh, as American language asthma book uh, that was was ever published. I actually have one in mint condition that I, I think I may have paid five dollars for. Um, it, it wasn't advertised in mint condition. I just kind of opened it up and realized it had never been opened. The the pages were still sealed sealed together. But uh, the vast majority of them were on uh, on on eBay, and um, I, I I I enjoy collecting them. Again, I, I don't buy near as many. I, um, I found one recently that was a, a brand of epinephrine I'd never seen before, so I, um, I bought it. <laughs> it's on the shelf, but um, not near as many as I used to. You know, Dr. Um, Har Harold Nelson and I have talked several times about the uh, the medicine collection. He has a smaller co collection as, as well, and he often, when I see him, often asks me what I found recently. So I appreciate the question. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Meadows, and thank you all for listening today. Uh, at this time, please download the handouts from your control panel. If you have any difficulties, please email us using the link in your email. Please join us next month for our December webinar when Dr. Leroy Graham will present on asthma disparities and differential responses to therapy. This webinar will air on Wednesday, December 4th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can register for this webinar on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Look for education in the horizontal navigational bar near the top of the page and scroll to webinars. 
You can also view our archived webinars on our website. Access our website for quality guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma. Also, look for important medical information on allergies and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to having you register to be with us in December on Advances in Allergy and Asthma. This is Gary Fitzgerald for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. We hope you have a great and a healthy day as we work to breathe better together.